So uh, Carol's going to give me a brief intro introduction, but um, I, my first kind of uh, love was my business, uh, Beyond the Pixels, in, in Melbourne, Australia. So I ran a studio um, for yeah, just under 10 years. Uh, we did all sorts of work from hospitality to kind of medical to um, big rebrands to tiny rebrands to kind of one-person shops and all, and all in between. Um, so this was our studio in Melbourne. Uh, I think we shared with some architects for a while. We did all sorts of fun stuff. We worked on whiskies. Um, we named a lot of different products from consumer goods through to um, large corporate entities like law firms. So this is kind of a nice kind of slice of my typographic kind of heritage, I guess, where I come from and kind of the work that I did previously. But I think it kind of leads nicely into talking about what I've done where I am now. So this gives you a little bit of a feel for kind of the care and polish and kind of level of quality that I kind of came, came from. Um, simplicity and kind of complex environments was something I really liked kind of pushing the team with. So this is a nice kind of example of that street sign in a very kind of chaotic space. Um, you know, it's, this was actually a cafe we did back in, I think it was like 2000. 2009, and it took off. It was a 27 foot space, and inside of that, we kind of came up with this idea of hand tiling the floor and creating our own typeface for that. We had this two and a half meter neon that we worked with this 90 year old um, guy that made fluoros at the time to kind of do the glass and kind of come up with all the craft. And then these kind of you know nice kind of custom frames and everything. So that hang, hung from the roof. It was huge. It just hung over the bar. It was a tiny space, so you kind of be, you'd walk in and enter, and you'd get your kind of, you know, nice kind of surprise as you're walking because there was actually no seating. Um, and then kind of when you're standing and waiting for coffee, and these guys were, you know, big purveyors of coffee that were really into it, um, sourcing stuff from around the world, single origin, beautiful stuff, and experimenting. Um, so we worked with them on a really cool project, but it kind of set us off on a bit of a tangent where, like, this project blew up and went like viral online. And I've seen so many cafes and things do the, both the kind of like replicas of these things. And I think it was one of those love jobs. I think we recorded that we, because we never build by the hour, we just kind of build project fees. Um, but I think it was like 5,000 hours or something. And I think we charged $5,000 for the whole <laughs> job. Like it was insane. It was really insane. Um, but a lot of fun. So whiskey that we named that has recently been acquired 49% um, by Diageo worldwide. Um, so I was kind of lucky enough to work with the founder. Um, he approached me um, for a photographer friend at the time, um, worked with him on kind of his story. Um, he'd been working on making this craft whiskey in Melbourne um, for nearly 10 years at that point when I came on board in 2010. And I basically kind of helped him yeah, tell a story. And we found this kind of really unique kind of story and heritage to it. I could go on about this forever, so I won't kind of go too deep into it, but we worked on some really nice products. So why we changed the news? Uh, well, firstly, my lovely wife, who is an architect, wanted to move to New York. So it's kind of, I blame everything on her for the move, but um, while I was going, she decided that she would move without me, which was an interesting decision at the time. Anyway, she, um, she, <laughs> She came over and was going to spend six months kind of just you know, working at a firm and wearing hard out. So I came over to sell her in um, and met a couple of people through a friend, the then creative director at Dow Jones. And uh, he, he introduced me to more people. It became apparent that I, like, I really liked a lot of the people there and kind of what they were doing. And from what I could tell, I could probably, rather than going to something like an Apple or the New York Times, where they design seems to be quite well kind of embedded and um, trusted and valued and all those kind of things in those organisations, whereas, which is like, like that's a good thing, um, but I, I felt like it could kind of affect the change and come in and kind of create some momentum around um, what design can do in an organisation. So, and at the same time, like I think the news industry, as we all know, is going through a really media landscape, it's going through a really interesting time, particularly in America. Um, and so, to be part of that, um, I felt would be really interesting. And I hadn't come from a news or media background, so for them to even be interested in hiring me um, 
I decided to stay a couple of extra weeks, interview with a lot of different people, um, and through that whole process, I kind of came out the other end and decided that I'd go back and close my business, which was a very, very hard decision, and probably something I could have only made being on the other side of the planet. So um, there was a lot of kind of tears and helping my staff find jobs and stuff when I got back, but um, because we were actually doing quite well at the time, but I thought it was like a good time in my life to do something different and, and kind of focus around one brand, which is a really interesting challenge as well, um, which I'll get into. So I went from that studio space that you kind of saw earlier to this obviously kind of very different corporate American landscape. And I actually remember when I signed the contract, the head of HR came to me and like shook my hand and was like, uh, welcome to corporate America. And I was like, holy shit. Wow. <laughs> um, but you know, in hindsight, it's been like it's been a really interesting journey the last three and a half years. And the first kind of year, um, I went from being in a product team that looked over Dow Jones, and Dow Jones got lots of different brands, including the journal. The journal is the one that you guys would all know the most. Um, that got kind of shifted around and moved into the newsroom, which was a really great move. And as part of that, I think that brought me on at the time. We all kind of knew that I was really interested in the kind of cultural change and um, finding really different disciplines and talented designers from different disciplines. So I kind of got um, through that wind of change a um, like just a really interesting opportunity to kind of go and build a team. Um, they're already a lot of talented people in the product design team at the time, but I was able to, I guess, kind of think about it a bit differently, um, and probably sometimes a little bit sneaky, like I'd kind of say, hey, you know, we're going to hire a whole bunch more designers, but I didn't say, I'm going to hire, you know, someone that's got a really strong brand identity background that's doing identities, I'm going to hire someone that actually has a print background when you've already got a team that's working on the paper, and you've already got marketing people that kind of think they're the brand. So like. Um, I was kind of opening them up to a whole bunch of different kind of disciplines. Um, so I went about basically kind of poaching and hiring because I guess the brand at the time to me was only attracting through their kind of network people that are interested in news. And I wasn't really interested in people that de did have a news background. Um, I was interested in bringing other people in to kind of challenge what it meant to think about you know, solving really interesting problems and thinking about what is the kind of brand identity, what are the emotional responses we get out of our readers, and what does it mean to be nearly 130 years old as a publication going through a digital kind of change and advertising tanking and um, all of those kind of interesting things. And the first publication to have a paywall on, and you know, ask for money to pay the journalists, that kind of stuff. So it's like, you know, it, it, all these things, they weren't necessarily communicating, they weren't all joined up in the experiences and things that you know, when you hit the paywall, it, yeah, whether that works or it doesn't, but the communication around them things I think is really critical. So um, after kind of going through a process of I guess probably 12 to 18 months, it took a really long time. Um, so I think you need patience when you're moving into an organisation that um, hasn't really operated with design in that sense of like, helping drive the direction of things and making change and embedding that kind of into the culture. So um, it's not to say it wasn't there, it wasn't valued. I think it was just treated very differently and it had just been doing its thing for a very long time. Um, so then I guess I kind of went through a bit of a research phase. So all the people I brought on, I wanted to kind of familiarize them with all the things that I dug up. So I'm pretty proactive, like I'll get up and I'll try and meet everyone. You know, there's like 5,000 people in the company. I was very interested in figure out what everyone did. Um, so I spent a lot of time just sitting with people, asking questions and really asking more questions. I didn't really contribute a lot to those conversations, I just ignored. Um, so that that process, I think, I kind of wanted to expose my kind of new team to. And uh, so I kind of allowed them to go and dive deep and they did kind of research. And a lot of the things that you find, you, you know, when there's 127 years history at that point, now I'm nearly 130, that the heritage and like there are kind of certain things that kind of come through and so you can like we dug up so much stuff you know, like old museums and all sorts of things and just kind of you know we were a digital product design team so doing that stuff is probably a bit odd i think to a lot of people in the company but they didn't really understand why necessarily but they were really eager to just give us information 
and just like to do it. Um, so that was quite an easy task in itself, and it was also just fascinating to kind of go back to a rich history like that um, and discover like the very first cover um, of the Wall Street Journal, or one number one, you know, 1889, it's a long time ago. So, and even then, like you're looking at the type, and it's just really fascinating to, just, to look at and absorb, and it's such an interesting aesthetic, and back then it was one page, it was one sheet as well. So we kind of pull all these things up, and um, you know, when you're distilling your kind of research, it's, it's also very hard to even figure out what things you're distilling, or how you unpack something, and how you kind of play it back to people, look like what you found. Um, so we kind of looked at things that I, I felt like we found that were core to you know news and how people consume news. So headlines is obviously very important. You know the title of the publication is very important, and anything else around that that supports it and re kind of affirms that that is the publication that you're reading at the time. Um, so we kind of focused on headlines, and obviously then you know around that there's obviously the body copy and things like that. But, you, know, you spend a lot of the time with your eyes kind of going over and back and forth. So we kind of dug up these moments in time, and there were three big kind of key moments that kind of came out of it. I obviously didn't load all of the fonts, apologies. Um, and one of the really great stories that came out of it for me was that there was this period of 70 years where nothing really changed that dramatically. Um, you know, and the master stayed where it was, the column, the Watson News column, which is, you know, still kind of left on the page and running down one side. All those things are, are kind of very iconic um, to the journal's history and kind of visual cues and all of that kind of stuff. Um, hadn't really changed. So, like, I mean, that's leaving a big imprint on people's minds. Like, they've printed, you know, millions and millions of these things, so, and millions of eyeballs. So it's, you know, that reinforced it. For me, that was like a lesson that I could take back to the team about not redesigning something. I know we're, we're in a much more complicated landscape and we're doing more visual storytelling and things now, but it was, I found that fit interesting, that you could kind of create these guardrails um, that nothing really changed for seven years. And I thought that was kind of an interesting job for a creative director. Maybe they didn't live through and they passed on them. <laughs> The, um, the knowledge of doing that. And then in 2006, which is kind of where we get to today, which is what I kind of discovered, um, is these, and unfortunately Tobias actually sent me a really lovely email um, before I came tonight, and it was, it was traveling, so he couldn't be here. But, um, so it was a bit, a bit sad, but very nice for me to send me a note and say good luck. Um, I did mean all the luck, actually. <laughs> um, but, so, there were three kind of core typefaces that came out of this big redesign. And that's escrow, which is used for our headlines. Exchange, which is, you know, to buy a special and, you know, it's a beautiful kind of body copy. It's actually used by Wired as well for their body copy. And Retina. Um, the interesting thing about Retina is that it's got these little kind of nice cuts and things. I'm not going to go into too much of the type nerdy thing because I'm going to get back into my story <laughs> in a second. But they call them agates and the reason they did it was because of the financial data at the back of the journal, there were these huge indexes of quotes and stocks, and they wanted to render it in kind of four and a half and five point tight and still be legible. So they had to put these cuts in it so when it bled, it would bleed into the cuts and still render really nicely. There's a lot of great work on the retina, and funnily enough, retina in all its glory works beautifully on retina screens and small screens. Um, not what it was designed for, but the connection so it's kind of roots that have been designed for small spaces and well crafted and re-hinted and re-cut and everything for digital has worked really well. I didn't have to do anything really special except, you know, look. And, and I think we kind of uncovered a lot of really great stuff. Um, you know, this was a landscape that I came into in kind of 2014 in November. And what I'd kind of found was that there were these core ingredients that kind of made up everything and that you know, looking at where it was, I'd also come into halfway through a redesign. So even though I'd found that there were these great old typefaces and we're going to recut them to digital, the dot com that you know today um, was redesigned with Chronicle and Whitney. And I was kind of at, on a mission to stop redesigning things at that point when I kind of got 
the team settled and stuff, but it was already underway and the train had kind of left the station, so we were adding a whole new set of fonts from Offload into the mix. Which is great, great typefaces, but they didn't, for me, have any connection to the core heritage. And, and so I, I struggled with it a little bit, and I've been patient <laughs> again um, to kind of, re, kind of re, reignite that fire and bring it all back again. So the core ingredients I'm talking about, not me, obviously, but um, these things we call stipples, which are head cuts. Um, they're kind of a trademark of the journal. We still have five artists. I think there's some really nice videos online you can watch about them doing it. But every single day, there's a story on the front page, and they use an artist to, one of the five artists is commissioned to draw a stipple for that story. Um, and we have this logo that's responsive already, like it was kind of designed to be digital. It's brilliant in all its glory, like it's so iconic and so recognizable. So it had these trademarkable, kind of ownable visual cues that were just kind of sitting there waiting for someone to like do something with them. Like we had one on the front page of the paper, we didn't really do anything with them anywhere else. Um, so it was kind of just really about unlocking those things and reminding people they existed and saying, you know, these two things along with our type are unique to us and we can kind of leverage them and lead with that. And so um, I found that like there was tons and tons and tons of fonts um, going around at the time, a lot more than this that I just put up here. But across all the channels that we look at, like the newspaper, all of our websites, all of our apps, our marketing material and our advertising campaigns, the magazine, the conferences and events we run, social media, you name it, like there's all of these channels. They had all of these fonts, like I think there's about 35 in total typefaces. And um, what we were really interested in doing is boiling it down to these three because each of them had a beautiful set of styles. We could then work with two font founders that were really eager to kind of experiment and work with us and do interesting things. So we worked with, with Paley from Type Network and Tobias really closely to kind of have these hinted and recut and work really nicely in the ways that we kind of want them to. So we've kind of boiled it down to this kind of, you know, these core ingredients of type and stipples and our mask head. And how we kind of get to express those is really up to the team. That's the fun part for everyone. Um, but that's, you know, that's a nice thing. If you do have a brand identity, if you forget about all those things, you're just kind of redesigning stuff all the time. And, you know, with news at the moment, and fake news and things like that, like establishing trust with readers and being consistent with how you present your kind of identity um, actually becomes quite important and needs to be recognizable on all sorts of platforms. Um, so just, just looking at those three typefaces, which are, you know, really beautiful and have a lot of styles and we're kind of thinking about working on a whole range of different new, new ones for our own kind of sets that will work with how we're kind of wanting to express um, stories in a digital kind of space as well. So Exchange, you know, is our beautiful kind of readable typeface for body copy. Um, one of the other unique properties about the journal is market data. We have this huge wealth of market data that we can tap into um, and leverage, and it's real time. I mean, Bloomberg is the only kind of competitor in that space. So we have, we have a, a bunch of things, and obviously the name, Wall Street Journal, is business, politics, finance, that's kind of our DNA. But so for us, we could use this beautiful headline, typeface, escrow, pair it with kind of, you know, what you can do with market data, the kind of, you know, you know allow people to kind of make great business decisions and then you know, retina works beautifully as a, as a sand in that kind of space and then exchange is kind of this great readable form that just kind of pins everything together. So it's way more complicated than that obviously, but you know, you can boil it down to those things, it's really nice. Um, so then getting into the complexity of digital, um, there is kind of you know, it's a really hard thing to design for. I, I often find people sit down and sketch or whatever, prototyping or designing code, and they draw like boxes and start kind of laying things out and draw more boxes and things. But like, it's a really hard um, space to deal with when Apple keeps, you know, bringing out new iPads and like new iPhones and like new screen sizes. And it's like, seems like every day. So, you know, having a system that still boils down to some kind of core ingredients is really important. Because another thing that um, we've been really big on in the last year um, 
which we've been working at a ton on, is kind of more around accessibility and diversity, because we've got this broad audience, right? Um, and like, how do we design products that are still really accessible to everybody? Um, and it's a really big challenge because you know at the same time you kind of want to present things differently in different, in different ways and you know something really big happens in the market one day it's a standard day it's a slow day whatever it might be um, doing all those things and then layering on accessibility you know there's obviously huge technical challenge huge design challenges and then you've got all the screen sizes on top of that so our design language has become quite sophisticated in that respect there's layers of things like accessibility being built in like our new iPhone app, which I'll get to in a bit, has um, more compliable kind of accessibility standards than Apple in terms of colour. So it goes through the gamut of you know, colour blindness and deals with all of those, you know, the scope that Apple is you know, not as compliant on as we are. So we're, we're making inroads, um, there's so much more to be done, but you know, we've got 2 million plus subscribers to you know, our product. So it's kind of one of those things that we need to think about. Um, as, as we go along. So you can say, this is just digital products as well. So when I go back to all those other channels, it just shows you the like, layers of complexity we're dealing with. Um, so as a team, to kind of start thinking about how we would even design for all of this, um, I got them to start auditing things. So they started looking at our digital products, and I said, you know, go and look at what are all the author names? We call them bylines. Like, what do they look like across everything? So we kind of scanned through. You know, this is a really kind of rudimentary, kind of repetitive example for an obvious reason. Um, they're all inconsistent. They're all really different. It's like, why? Like, what's the point of doing that? And that's great, guys. Like, that you just read as like keep redesigning bylines, but like, how much fun is that? Like, surely there's other things you could be doing. Um, and part of the problem was that there's all these different teams as well, right? And not just different teams, but different times things are being designed, and different layers on the website. And the website was 20, 20 something years old, and there's old pages and stuff. And, and so you'd like, it, it's like once you dig and you pull up the thread, you can see like how painful that is for someone that comes from my background of looking at something and wanting to simplify it. Um, so you can pull that stuff apart, but they're huge challenges. So getting to that, on top of it, we have teams that come in and be like, you know, what if we just change the font on the byline and we tested like five different fonts and that worked really well. And whichever one comes out with the data most people click on, we we'll use that. And we're like, what? How is that a good idea? Like, how is that? And so we're like starting to think about how do you measure the brand identity and the recognition to a reader and stuff. It's like it's a really hard thing to think about even measuring on that kind of scale, right? And at that speed at which all these things are taking place to our product. So um, that's a kind of challenge, one that we're kind of ever kind of evolving and dealing with. Licensing was huge. Um, I kind of inherited just you know this stack of old paperwork and stuff that I could find and. So I had to work with these great partners through John Hoffler and Tobias and Paley and a number of others to figure out kind of all of, like simplify it. Because we, we used to have old printers that would have typefaces installed in their roofs and we'd go, you know, we'd have a 2000 CPU license for certain things. And people, no one really knew. It was just like, this stuff had just happened and happened and happened and happened. And it was like fascinating. And so, you know, you're kind of uncovering that stuff and well, it's all working and great. It's like, but you know, I, I wanted to find out things and like figure it out. And like, I'm buying that license. What does that mean? What does it cover? So you know, I kind of had to lead that. So that was also just an interesting challenge to just kind of go through and you know, and audit all of that stuff and figure it out and kind of get to a point where it was really clear and we kind of documented it for the next generation as well. Um, and build in kind of new technologies and off-platform experiences like Apple News and things like that that are now allowing us to put our typefaces on them. So we're kind of prepared for that evolution. And the other one is kind of this idea of working in silos. I don't think anyone goes to work thinking that they want to work in a little corner. Maybe they do, I don't know. But it's, it was really interesting to me that these people have just kind of been quite happy doing that. But it was also like, I think, really refreshing when I started pushing everyone to talk 
So there's like, while I didn't all report to me, I can kind of see collaboration through just basically going and saying, hey, this is what we've been doing. You know, we're, we're, you know, the conversation was led around, and not just the designers, but you know, business stakeholders up to the CEO and, and above. I had lots of conversations about typefaces, and I led them not with design, but with, I'd come from running a business, and you know, there's a strategy behind this. We've underpinned it with the heritage. We're looking back on the history of the journal and what's really important to its visual cues and what's you know, makes it the journal and why does it feel like the journal? Like, why do you look at the newspaper and you think that's the journal? Um, you know, you can't tangibly always put your finger on those things, so I had to kind of bring it to life in a kind of different way. Um, and the conversation definitely wasn't around design, um, and ultimately it was around news. So I, I took the whole story through a news lens with business and strategy, not design. Um, and that, I think, opened a lot more doors as well, in that sense, um, particularly because like um, where we get to next, it's what I was saying, it's not a design thing. So this is a much larger decision for a company to make about its brand identity and making those kind of big changes. And you know, the Wall Street Journal is definitely not a design company. I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, you know, it's just it's one of those things that just means you need to be more strategic, you need to kind of introduce design in very different ways. Um, you can't talk about it, you just kind of have to go and do it um, and, and speak to people and educate them and take the time and patience to kind of do that. Um, so I'm going to kind of show you where, we've, where we're kind of at now um, with kind of this evolution. So some really cool things, we've worked with the video department who have really upped their game in the last kind of six months or so in terms of production quality. Got a great team in place. There's like 40 odd producers globally. Um, you know, great team of motion graphics people that I helped kind of hire and work with as well. Um, I've embedded someone in my team with product design experience, working with them to build out all the complex kind of design systems and, and design language and, and translate that into like video and motion graphics, which is, is, is a really tricky proposition because it goes on TVs, it goes on tiny devices, it goes on YouTube, it goes on laptops and phones and vertical phones and everything, right? So dealing with that and closed captions and um, all of that fun stuff um, is what we're really working on. This is just kind of a short example, but you get to see kind of how we've also created different flavors. So we've taken, you know, retina and used it in a very different way than it was originally kind of intended, but it gives a, the content a very different time. So we've built out this kind of library that had, depending on the tone and the content, we can actually kind of create different personalities for the videos, but they're still all kind of underpinned and feel like the journal. Like that's the kind of core thing we're always aiming for. So all of these things are like, we're sitting with these motion graphics people and the editors and the, and, you know, the videographers and motion graphics people to figure out like what are the problems that they're facing, like the little gradient at the bottom, you know, there's like tons of little nuances. We've still kept it really simple and clear and beautiful and even like more animated WSJ that kind of types in. So all those little bugs and things we've kind of you know, put a lot of care and polish into it and spent, you know, again, like hundreds of hours just with these people to understand from their point of view how they're facing creating a video on a deadline. Right? We don't have the same deadlines that they do. We're not storytellers in that sense, but we have to understand their world and be able to kind of support them. Hence kind of putting someone in, in with them. And what that's also allowed us to do is kind of build like this much bigger system. This is a tiny snapshot of just videos, right? So if you think about all the other channels and all the other content types, um, you can kind of get a grasp for kind of how complicated the environment is and all of the different types of things but when I'm simplifying my head, I'm like, hey, everyone, three fonts, go for it, great. It, like, coming back to the reality of it all is a very big challenge and still making it look really good. So you can see we're using escrow for, like, more serious tone content on the right, you know, light-hearted discovery, beautiful stuff. We've got rendering market data. We've got maps. Obviously, I've highlighted Australia. It's great. It's my hometown. Um, but it's, you know, it gives you a sense for, like, this big system. Um, and all the things around it are needed to make it up and the challenges they face in producing videos every day. 
Um, another great thing, because when I landed, I was like so frustrated that the marketing team used Flamo and all these other weird fonts. And I was like, but our products like go in the marketing ads. Like, what's going on? The products like in there just like bashing against them. They don't feel like anything to do with the Wall Street Journal. They're like, it's like an ad with like our product stuck on it kind of thing. So it was like, but well, again, it wasn't my team. So I had to like work with an agency that's internal um, to kind of retranslate them. And you know, they're on deadlines and working campaigns and doing all sorts of stuff, right? So I was just coming into their world and being like, hey, can I make you change everything? Um, but they've done a really great job. Like this is a good example of again, bringing stipples to life and animating the type you know, I think they're starting to really get it now. It's, it's, it's taken a while, but I think we're kind of getting to a point where there's also a level of polish coming out of the kind of campaigns and the advertising that we're doing as well, which are all starting <coughs> to kind of feel like a journal. So kind of making good strides in that regard. And then again, you know, we run these huge conferences um, you know, one, this is the CEO council I was lucky enough to go to to kind of spend some time interviewing CEOs about our products. But um, again, expressing, like, for me it was like an obvious thing. Like, I didn't, again, I didn't do this. This is crafted by a whole other team of designers, but they're now using the stipple. It looks beautiful. It's treated in a really nice way. There's like a lot more care and attention to the craft. The types, you know, kerned, you yeah, know, it's pretty good. But like, they're all getting getting it, they're starting to kind of figure it out. So like for me to see it come to life on these big stages and things like that, um, and all of these things coming together, all these different teams coming together and kind of starting to figure it out is really, really nice. And the things that are kind of very much in my control, um, not always, because there's lots of people um, having a, an opinion, um, but is, is all the kind of digital experiences, so our apps, our website, on platform and stuff like Snapchat, Alexa and Google Home and all that kind of fun stuff, even digital. Um, so one of the things that I did was work with a team on like what are the core kind of design principles for news? What kind of for news specifically um, kind of underpins like the reading experience? What are the kind of things that we need to be thinking about every time? Um, so I, again, kind of a bit more strategically kind of worked with our editor and our chief and our executive editor um, to come up with three that kind of gave it, you know, gave our team something to always kind of pee on the wall when we were doing anything to do with the news side of things. So, I mean, I can go into these, but creating a sense of hierarchy seemed like an obvious one, but when you come to a home page or you come to the front page and it's the journal's position on the markets and the news that day, like creating hierarchy for readers in that environment is incredibly important because like what's first, what's second, what's like, oh, that's like, what's happening in the markets, what's going on, and then being able to convey importance through that system as well. And then the third one is distinguishing different types of content. So, you know, as readers, like, what's an opinion piece versus, because it's, you know, a different department in another building kind of thing, like, what is that? Like, how does that, you know, to you guys, like, be presented visually, and how is it indicated, how is it labeled? Um, all of those kind of things, so, you know, breaking news, video content, etc. Um, so the team kind of has them to underpin everything they do. Um, so going back to like now, like the iPhone, which was really our first foray into like a fully fledged kind of redesign. We work in a very much an agile environment otherwise, but this one really needed some work and we use this as a good test case to think about mobile in a different way. So the first thing we did is we basically as a, as a company created a mobile editorial team. So they're curating content for mobile specifically. So the feed on the iPhone app, on the mobile, on the, is curated specifically by journal editors, just as important as the front page of the paper, but it's curated for the phone. And so we work with them really closely to translate all of that stuff that we've done before into distinguish different types of content, create a sense of hierarchy. So you know what's important, um, markets, data, you know, Here's your hierarchy cards. Here's your stipple card that comes from the front page of the paper. That's that story every day on the front page. Bring that to life. Um, you know, more visual, in-depth stories, leaders. You know, um, all of that kind of stuff is like built-in labeling. Like you, you can kind of see it in the red and the kind of copper. All of those things and those colors are all the accessible colors that I was talking about. So 
we ripped out probably 30 plus colors as well in this game, paired it right back, and we can use it for interactions and other things to notify people about things that are happening um, and kind of give feedback as they're kind of navigating and doing stuff. So, actually only two days ago, really great story is that for the Society of News Design, which has been around for a really long time, um, gave us an award for product design. So we won the product design award for this iPhone app redesign. Um, and I think we're starting to make some really big inroads. So we've, you, know, you can see Retina in its kind of home space at the bottom in tiny type, working beautifully on a phone. I mean, you need to look at it on a phone, but you can kind of get the sense. It's kind of now come back into an environment where it's dealing with a really small space and you know, a small point size and still kind of coming to the fore. Bringing market data to life, um, all of these things are live, so these have got lots of last little beautiful animations and things like that. But again, you can see Retina kind of coming to the fore with its Retina Narrow and you know, the, the numeral sets and all of that stuff have like been transformed. We're working on kind of a whole other set around pure like tabular figures and a bunch of stuff around market data that are kind of custom for us that solve a whole bunch of different problems that we have with displaying this stuff every day and in different ways. Um, and again, those kind of different types of content being pulled together. Um, we went also from like 120 stories on mobile web on the homepage to 25. So it's really curated, like it's come right back as you can imagine, everyone wants their thing, every editor wants their thing. Yeah. Um, so you can see the article on the right where you know, we allowed people to kind of scale the type size and save and share and all that kind of fun stuff really easily and really quickly. Um, so to get to that point, like a lot of the levers and things that we used were customer testing, you know, looking at data, looking at analytics. Um, but we had a lot of gut feelings as well about stuff that we're making, like the typography. Um, and I'm pretty sure I learned most of this response from a customer that actually said this, and we had it said a few times, that the app feels like the journal, and we were like, this is like awesome. We are like on the right track. Um, you know, we didn't ask necessarily why or anything like that, because it was more of a like, you know, customer testing like methodology, so we weren't kind of getting too in depth about things, but um, that was kind of their emotional reaction. So um, we feel like we have to kind of hit the nail on the head in lots of ways. Um, so all of those kind of bits and pieces that you saw floating around, those libraries, style guides, guidelines, and stuff like that, um, have been a really kind of core part about how we have gone about introducing it into other areas of the business as well and exposing it. Um, we kind of boiled them down into basically one thing that we just call Blueprint, um, which we've trademarked and we launched, you know, we've worked on this for the last kind of year and a half, which will launch externally as well. But this is our CEO actually launched this internally. So he sent this to the entire company and was like, here are our kind of standards and guidelines for everything. And so I had to obviously pull in marketing guidelines and sub brands and like stuff from all over the shop into this and it was a really good chance to kind of work on that stuff. So I'm just showing the type areas of it at the moment, but you can kind of interact with it. So editors or anyone can go in here and just play around with the type and see how it responds and what it does. Um, and you know, whether it's engineers, product people, editors, marketing, um, anyone can kind of go and actually use it. And people have been using it because of analytics on it too. It's connected to a Google Drive because our whole company is on Google Enterprise. So all the assets, font files, sketches, the right licensing, all that stuff, grids, icons, it's all built in. So it's all centralized and everyone contributes. So everyone's maintaining it. It's not one of those like brand guidelines I did for my old company where you kind of do it, hand it over, and it's like best of luck. Um, it, and they sit there on the shelf and you pour your heart and so on to build these big brand guidelines. I think those things are more symbolic than they are useful to companies um, of change or whatever it might be. So, I mean, that's a whole other talk. But now we have this like um, oops, sorry, you know, beautiful kind of family of products. There's a lot more work to do on crafting and polishing and um, kind of where we're going. Um, but a lot of what we're doing next is kind of backing all of this thinking and um, we craft and design back into like the paper and the web and 
but not huge changes, but they'll just take like slow kind of momentum. It won't be like the iPhone, but um, all of these things are starting to really kind of come together, which is nice. Um, so there were a few kind of big lessons for me. Um, one is, you know, this is a quote from Paul Rand, but um, design is relationships. I think he talked about it from the interviews and scripts and stuff I've read, and more about form and function. But for me, it was all about the people. Um, so seeding kind of collaboration between all these people who didn't report to me um, by just spending time with them and listening to their problems and history and story and all that kind of stuff. So I think really good design kind of comes from um, relationships, really, because um, it's all about people. And it's the reason I moved to news was actually for the people more than that was the carrot, not the actual organisation or the brand or anything else. Um, and then, I mean, the other one is really to kind of go into the world without an agenda. It's, it's probably the hardest thing to possibly do. Um, but it, it kind of, you know, otherwise, basically, you wait until you see what you want to see. And I think that's really good advice to designers, is to try and go into the world without an agenda. Um, because, you know, that's why you go through design school, to have critiques and figure out how to take really harsh criticism on personal stuff you've produced. Um, so I think the more you go out in the world without an agenda and you observe and you listen and you question um, and you get to the bottom of things, uh, the, the better the outcomes will be. And I think most of the big surprises um, and things that we've done that have been good in our projects have come from that kind of way of thinking. Um, it's almost going into a meeting to present work, you put it up, you don't say anything because you're very quick to defend work and talk about why and the rationale, but sometimes just let people soak it up, um, people that have fresh eyes, and just talk about it from their point of view. Um, and then the third lesson I learned is that design is super valuable, obviously, um, but I've probably spent, you know, the good part of that 10 years running my company trying to convince people of the value of design, monetary to business to whatever else. Um, and I'd always talk about it and try and write about it and articulate it in some kind of theoretical way. And I found that the best way to actually do it is to go and do it um, and to kind of empower teams to go and do work and just show it. Never actually talk about the value of design. Um, I think it really almost devalues design because it's very hard for people to even tangibly understand what you're even talking about. And then they just pick and hold you as a designer and you've already lost. Um, so I think that's it. I didn't really kind of you know, talk about design in the whole process. We just kind of went about doing it. Um, and I think that was probably the most powerful message in all of it. Um, yeah. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um,